Hello. So today we are talking about analyzing and interpreting data. And I'll just start by saying that we collected some data at the end of the last science lesson. We, um, if you remember, there was the dry ice puck and we chose our variables. We could only cho choose two and then we compared them. And I went ahead and collected some data here. Um, so now I am presenting this data to you and there are many ways that data can get presented. You could just show people a table and you could show that the, the here's the mass, here's the final velocity, um, here's the kinetic energy that got calculated from that. Um, and then you could also present it in graph form. So this graph, I compared two variables, the final velocity and the mass. Um, you can change the titles of graphs to really tell your audience what you want them to even think about what they see. Or you could just give a, a standard basic scientific title like um, mass versus uh, velocity update. And so <clears throat> the way you present the data really <clears throat> can influence the person that you're showing it to, to hopefully, if you want them to, come up to the same conclusion as you. So this one says final velocity and mass, but if I were to add another graph from that same data set, and this time, instead of selecting final velocity, I selected kinetic energy, and then I selected mass, and I could title this one mass versus kinetic energy. Um, you can see that this graph really shows you some information. So you can actually add trend lines to it. So let's see if it will let me do it. Mm -hmm. Curve fits, linear, done. So it will it can add a line. So it really just shows the observer, look, as we increase the mass of this puck, the kinetic energy at the very bottom of the ramp. Remember, if you just hit this, we were measuring the kinetic energy at the bottom and comparing it to the potential energy at the top. Look, this is solid evidence, right? So that's that's the data that we collected. And this, these are two ways that you could present it. See, this one doesn't really <laughs> tell much of a story where I can make this one really tell a story just by changing the variable that I put over here. Does that make sense? Are there any questions? No, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to move on to was looking at larger, more professional data sets. Um, so there's this article written by the New York Times, and it's 75 New York Times graphs for students to analyze. And I thought this is the perfect resource for this lesson because if you scroll down in the article, you can choose many different graphs and then you can click around inside of them. So um, is there one that you, that's like really popping out at you based on their title that you want to look at? Just like any of those ones? Any of them. Um, Price of eggs, maybe? Yeah, any of these. Let me think. Um, yeah, let's just go with that one. Price of eggs. Okay, we'll look at that one. And for those of you that are watching the recording, I'm hoping that I can provide this link to you. But um, if it's not working for some reason for you to load it, you can just watch the video and, and look at the way I'm pushing the buttons. Um, so the question is, what's going on with this graph for the price of eggs? Like, what do you notice? Well, the price difference from 2000 to 2020 is like about 
like over two dollars. Mm hmm It's kind of all over the place. Yeah. Like it's not really like it got more expensive just like like on one level. Like it just kind of went back and forth. Yeah, it's not really like a straight line. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then so things that I ask myself when I'm looking at a set of data like this is, okay, what are the X and Y axes? What are they actually showing me? Um, so this is dollars. And it says monthly average price of a dozen eggs. So... And then it has years at the bottom and it doesn't go lower than 2000. Um, and I'm wondering things that I'm asking myself about this is like, is this the monthly average price of a dozen eggs across the country? Like, where is this the price of eggs? Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes you can find that information like at the bottom of the graph or, you can be, or you can read like the article below and maybe the, they all tell you, but a lot of times you get presented with a graph and then told what to think about it. But sometimes like the data was manipulated a little bit. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case here, but it just makes you, you kind of like, there's this, there's like a list of questions that I like to think about when I get presented with a new graph, you know? Also, you could think like, what yeah. type of graph is this? This is, looks like a scatter plot. And then they've added like lines to connect all of the little dots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it looks like the price of eggs have spiked before in the past. This is like the highest spike that I see above yeah. four. And I noticed that they really wanted to highlight that that data point was $4.25 and it didn't tell me like it they didn't really highlight this point you know so they're yeah. really trying to make the point with this graph that eggs like are that's the like the highest spot yeah eggs are the most expensive they've ever been yeah um yeah so i that's kind of what they're wanting me to get out of this graph let's see is there something else that um let's you? do like well, um at the top there was like yeah. Um, like global climate risks or climate threats, like either of those? Sure, we'll do both of them. They could be different types of graphs. So this is like a map overlay. Um, I noticed that there's lots of colors, so I'm going to have to find the key if I could. Or maybe they don't have a key. You just, okay, you like hover over the county and it tells you, oh, it changes the text at the top. So this is very interactive. It's totally different type of graph, right? Yeah. Um, do you know the name of the county you live in? Um... I live in Marion County. Where are you? I honestly don't think I do. Okay. Uh, there's many counties in... There's Polk. There's Marion. The greatest climate threat to Marion County, Oregon is extreme rainfall. Okay. Wildfire risk is medium. So it looks like blue means extreme rainfall. Red, there's wildfire risk. Yeah, that's interesting, like the different colors, and then it tells you like what that means. Yeah, and you can see in the little box, it says high, high, medium, low, no risk, no risk. So it's not yeah. necessarily the only risk to that county. It's just the highest risk. Yeah. But it looks like on the West Coast, it's either fire or rain. Water stress is a large risk in the center of our country. And it looks like there's like darker yellow. Oh, very high. Do you see that? Yeah. Light yellow and dark yellow. What is this dark blue? Very high risk of rainfall, I see. Hurricanes are in the green. Heat stress. 
Look at this one. That's so weird. Look at that one blue one right there. in the middle of the water and heat. And there's extreme rainfall, but only in this exact spot. That Everybody only one else spot. is at a water stress. <laughs> That's weird. Okay. Purple is sea level rise. There's only a few of those. Oh, there's some over here, aren't there? But only in northern? Okay. This is an interesting graph. It is very interesting. And there's like... Not, I don't know, like, you could take this, there's a lot of data to analyze on this graph. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then I'm kind of like, all right, what does, what does it say below? Um, okay. But it doesn't really tell me more in this article. This is just like, what? You should ask, but mm -hmm. um, okay, that's interesting. I'm wondering, like, is this a climate risk this year, or is this climate risks at like a predicted climate risks at a certain point in the future? I don't really see that information. Yeah, it doesn't. It there. doesn't really say. And oh, it was published on October fifteenth, twenty twenty. Okay. And it was last updated in 2020, so it's four years old. And that thing to notice. Alrighty. Yeah. We'll do the other one. Um, global climate risks. Oh, well, this looks like the same map, just way bigger. Yeah. And it's not interactive. Oh yeah, that one just has a little key. Yeah. Huh. Do you notice anything about it? Um, I don't have it pulled up on my screen, so they're kind of, the words are kind of little, but let me zoom in. Okay. Blue is flooding. Orange is heat okay. stress. Yellow is water stress. Red is wildfires. Teal is hurricanes. And then that purple color is sea level rise. So it has the same key. Yeah. I guess what, like, I would be most curious about would be, like, the white at the top. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. that, that's kind of all over, but it, there's no key for it. Yes. Why is that white? Good question. Yeah, like that's probably what I would think of right away because it's not in the key. And there's a little bit of white here at the bottom of South America. Yeah. And in Africa. And in the middle of Australia, there's some white. And even in North America right there. Hmm. Yeah. World's top climate risks by 2040. Okay, so that gives us some information. This map shows the world's top climate risks by 2040 if greenhouse gas, gas emissions are not cut drastically. Okay. And it was published in 2021. So it's a year newer. <clears throat> yeah. And I appreciate that it told me like what it means. I like that. Yeah, that one didn't oh. give you as much. It's in the key, too. The top climate yeah. risks across the globe by 2040. There we go. Hmm, okay. Do you want to look at one more? I'm um, sure. Does anything else stand out to you? Oh, maybe that air pollution one. U.S. air pollution? Yeah. Okay. All right, another map. Air pollution deaths per 10,000 residents. Well, hmm, and that's all. So is it saying like the darker is like the more? So I'm guessing, and then the light is like the less. Yep, those are great questions to ask. It's what do the colors mean? What is the key for this? Uh, I think that it means per ten thousand people that live there. So automatically, when I look at map data, sometimes it can get manipulated because California has a ginormous population. So mm -hmm. when they say like California has the most deaths by car accident, they're not like factoring in that California also has the most people. Yeah. You know, so sometimes people can make claims like that just to like get attention or, you know, stir some reaction yeah. to whatever they're trying to say. But 
this one, you can see that they took into account the population size. So it's <clears throat> the number of deaths by air pollution divided by 10,000 people in the population. So if it's, if it's like, I think uh -huh. Montana has a, a small population, but that won't matter because they took care of that by <clears throat> dividing by 10,000 or, you know? Yeah. So yes, it says, so for per 10,000 people, if it's light purple, then it means one person dies from air pollution. Um, two, three, and four. Okay. So then my next question is like, clearly the, the more populated states are these dark, dark purple. Like we have New York City here. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that Chicago is, is it in Illinois? Um, and then California is very highly populated, so wondering if like the amount of cars and the amount of pollution because of the people there if is that what they're saying that like these ones that's the reason they're not really telling me what to think about it they're just showing yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah and then it doesn't happen as much in these ones which are less populated but i mean nevada does have las vegas which is yes yeah. But it's the lightest color. Yeah. Hmm. Air pollution. I wonder how someone dies from air pollution. That's another question I have. Yeah. It would have and, to be very intense. <laughs> yeah. And the other question I have is for 10,000 people, for one of them to die from this or four of them to die from this, is four out of 10,000 that much different than, than one out of 10,000? 10, in my brain, I don't know. It don't doesn't know. seem like it would be. Yeah, like if this was like 10, 20, 30, or like one, yeah. 200, 300, but between one and four? That's it just doesn't seem like it'd be that big of a difference. I know. So like... I'm wondering what use this graph is at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. They don't really say. The rate of premature deaths from combustion-related air pollution, ozone, and fine airborne participles. Oh, this one shows the division. There's another one. Of those air pollution deaths caused by in-state and out-of-state sources. Okay. Hmm. Air pollution. Hmm. Okay. Alrighty. Well, is there another one that was jumping out at you or is that enough graphs? Um, I think that's good. Okay. Well, you have the link if you're interested in. Yeah. Dissect yeah, the link worked just fine. Like, so okay. if you were going to send it out, it totally works. Okay, good. Um, I'm glad about that. Alrighty, so the next thing that I'm going to go through now that we've kind of done our own job of analyzing data is I really wanted to share with you, this is a slideshow present uh, made by a different teacher that I purchased from Teachers Pay Teachers, but I really liked the message that this was sharing just about um, being a wary citizen or asking questions whenever you're presented with data. Because, you know, after you finish high school, you're going to be an adult in our society and you're going to have the responsibility of making important decisions such as like voting and not necessarily just voting for like a president or a mayor, but there are smaller issues that you vote on. And a lot of people want you to vote one way or the other, and they'll present data to try and convince you that this is the right way to vote on like like an issue that comes up maybe like in your state, or you can even have issues that you vote on as small as like a city at the city level. Like, should we build this new building here? Yes or no. So mm -hmm. 
um, just kind of like <laughs> people use data in a lot of ways. And I'm sure that yeah. like on social media, it's everywhere, right? So yeah. the teacher put in a disclaimer. This is not intended to like, it's just to give you examples. And it's not like a commentary or criticism of any political climate candidate or figure. Um, and I didn't write it. So <laughs> <laughs> just using it. Um, all right. Understanding science. The first thing that this goes over is science is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. It just means that it's the sum of our attempts as humans to collect information and determine what is like always true about the world around us and People do this by observing and experimenting. And this is one of my favorite examples. And I think I think about it all the time when I'm like planning a lesson um, that we've been doing this process since we were born. Um, you start to experiment. You reach out when you're a baby and you like touch things like babies really love to like touch and feel like something soft and then they like move their arm out and touch again and that's that's like a literal experiment like is that going to feel the same way if I touch it every time um another <laughs> another like experiment that toddlers really love to do is like you know have you ever seen a baby that like sits in a high chair and like drops their toy and then laughs mm -hmm. and then someone yes. comes and picks it up for them and then they do it again <laughs> and they're like they're testing their parents, obviously, to see if they'll get their toy back. But they're maybe they're just like doing a little gravity experiment. Like, if I let go of this in the air, does it always go down or will it go up? You know, like things that you've been doing this for a long time. And I sometimes say like babies are probably the best scientists that we have. <laughs> um, so our methods and areas of focus, they change as we age. But we continue to informally experiment as we observe every single day of our lives. And it's how we learn. <clears throat> so that's informal science, like that baby example. And I mean, other examples. And then there's formal science. So informal science is just everyday questioning and observing and learning from experience. Everyone does this and it's the learning process. It can be heavily influenced by our surroundings background knowledge and feelings. And we can generally use this to determine patterns and apparent truths that apply specifically to our lives, but it could maybe not hold true for others. Like, I guess, going back to that baby example or whatever, um, let's say that there was a baby that lived in an apartment and the floor of their apartment wasn't quite level. It was like at a slope. And they were sitting in the same spot every day and they would set their little ball down. And every time they set it down, it always roll away from them, right? So maybe they would come up to the conclusion that, oh, balls always roll. Like they'll never just sit still, you know? But a different baby lives in an apartment that has like a level floor and they set their toy down, the same exact toy, and it doesn't roll. So that would be like maybe a maybe an example of that. Um Formal objective science, it's performed by scientists, researchers, and doctors, and it sets out to determine what is true for all people using testable hypotheses and evidence. It sets aside convenience, personal motivation, and feelings, and the big thing is that it seeks peer review from other scientists and researchers before being published as a trustworthy finding. So if a scientist plans an experiment like we did with the ice puck, and um comes up with a conclusion kind of like we did that, hey, look, look at this graph, it's exactly perfect. They actually have to type up a report giving like exact details of how they took every single data point and what they used and they submit it to a scientific journal and it can't get published in the journal for other people to read until other scientists practice the exact same experiment and come up with the same results. So it's kind of, it's really hard to get a science article published. Any questions about that? 
No. No. Okay. <clears throat> so peer review, whenever a scientist or researcher writes an academic paper, oh, I just said this. <laughs> guess I didn't have to make it up, but um, it has to go through the peer review process before being published in an academic journal. Um, it's when an academic draft is evaluated by one or more experts in the exact same field to ensure quality, credibility, and suitability for publishing. <clears throat> it is not, however, right all of the time. Any number of things can go wrong. Scientists can make mistakes on how they gather their data or communicate their information. The equipment can malfunction, given an invalid results. One scientist may come to one conclusion after an experiment only to have their peers and other scientists find a completely different conclusion in that same experiment. Um, and I just want to clarify that these peers that they're talking about are typically scientists that live on the other side of the country or like on maybe in a different country altogether. So it's like a global community of scientists and they won't be like whoever's like next door to them. Um, the important thing to remember is this. The only thing that refutes formal science is better or more reliable science. So if another scientist, if someone posts a, posts a finding and another scientist comes out, and they go through the peer review process and they post a better finding, then that's that's the new like collective knowledge that everybody agrees on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, informal science is not bad. It's how we learn, but informal everyday science can be an important part of becoming a more educated human being. It can become problematic when it gets confused with, or intertwined with formal science, and this can lead to formation of misconceptions and pseudoscience. A misconception is simply an incorrect view or opinion based on faulty thinking and understanding. Does this mean people with in misconceptions are dumb or bad? No, it means that they're just humans and they have they navigated their life with this misconception so here's an example as a younger kid you may have thought that the moon changes shape every night or that maybe it was made of cheese and neither of those things are true but believing them doesn't mean you were dumb you just had a misconception about the moon um pseudoscience can be tricky to spot but by definition, it's not genuine science. It's tricky to spot because it's a collection of beliefs or practices that claim to be based on science and facts, but are incompatible with the scientific method. Meaning that our most rigorous formal science practices have never been able to conclusively or repeatedly confirm these claims through experiments. <clears throat> you can spot pseudoscience by if it's using vague, exaggerated, or untestable claims, it's relying on confirmation rather than refutation. Like saying like, well, we don't have proof that it's not true. It has misleading language. There's a lack of progress in the field or they like, if you try to question it, they might attack people who question what they're talking about. Um, these are some examples of pseudoscience. Oh, the Meyer Briggs personality types. Those are fun, though. <laughs> Apparently, they're pseudoscience. Um, okay. The next word that we're going to talk about is bias. Everybody has a bias and it's prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person or group compared with another, usually in a way that is considered to be unfair. Um, people can have biases for like colors, right? Like if you were making the map of the climate change map that we looked at a little bit ago, you might have some bias for like which colors you wanted to put on the map versus others, right? Yeah. So it's just... um. It's just a human, everybody has a bias for something, right? And some of yeah. them can be quite evil, but some of them are just like, I like the color blue sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
implicit biases are not something that we form in our minds on purpose, and they're formed by our experiences, attitudes, and our brain's natural tendency to seek patterns in the world. <clears throat> you can like think about your own biases and try and understand them, but the important thing is to remember that the that people that are sharing information on social media or on the news, they're also humans. And so they also absolutely have biases as well. So just kind of like taking that into consideration when you listen to the information they're sharing. Um, <clears throat> it can be considered like bias in the news can be, it can show unjustifiable favoritism towards something or someone. And a lot of times they use graphs and data to like make their point, but um, you can manipulate that sort of stuff, you know? Um, okay, let's see, there was one more thing. Oh, this one, yeah. So there's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. So some people, like going back to the social media example, like they're like, oh, I found this hack. Have you ever seen those like posts? Uh -huh. Yeah. And then like you try it and it didn't work at all. And mm -hmm. or you watched one and you thought it was really cool. And then you go to like tell your mom about it but you messed up the punchline or like you forgot a piece of it, that's false information that you're spreading. Yeah. And it's pretty innocent because it happens every day and it's easy to misremember or misunderstand things, right? That's yeah. misinformation. And then disinformation is knowingly and intentionally spreading misleading information or propaganda. So that would be somebody posting something on social media and like trying to convince everybody that this is absolutely true when they actually know that it's not. Um, mm -hmm. They're doing it on purpose. <clears throat> so you can spot this sort of thing by checking the source. So like we were scrolling underneath the graphs, well, they were all from the New York Times, but you can figure out, okay, well, where did this information come from? Where are your sources? Um, yeah read the about us section of a website. Like if somebody sends you to a website as like proof of something, read the about us section and it could be registered with like a political organization. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, read more than just the headline. So like I was talking about with our, our ice puck graph, like I can manipulate what you're going to think about this graph if I just write the title that I want you to, like if I write what I want you to think, as the title, then, mm -hmm. and some people only read that. So maybe reading like those little, like like we were doing, like what does this key mean? Does 10, does one out of 10,000 versus four out of 10,000 make that much of a difference? Or yeah. reading those fine texts at the bottom like we were doing. Um, you can check and see if other larger or more reputable news outlets are reporting the same thing. So you can say, oh, wow, that's really shocking. And then go to a different website and see if they're already telling the same story or is it just on one spot? Um, and then there's some fact checking websites, factcheck.org or Snopes um, that you can type your question into, I think. Mm -hmm. Um. I thought this was a good point on this slide. Um, skepticism, what should you believe? Like my goal in this lesson is not to say like, don't trust anyone and don't believe anything anybody ever says, but skeptical just means that you, you're, you have more questions after being presented with information. Um, so what level of skepticism is healthy and when does it go too far? Uh, I don't know, what do you think? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. It's okay. Um, I think like, there's obviously like a point to where at one point it's just kind of like, either like making stuff up or completely spreading stuff that's not true. Mm -hmm. 
But I feel like there's like a point of like curiosity and you're just kind of guessing. But then I think it kind of gets to a point where it starts to be just kind of like spreading rumors, you know, almost. Yeah. Yeah. It would definitely absolutely be like spreading rumors. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about like, <clears throat> like the sharing side of it, like when people are posting this information. Yeah. Yeah. Like websites or stuff or whatever, like where do you find stuff? And if it's even um, like reliable, like where'd you even get it from? Yeah. Yeah. And then like skepticism is like, it's from the point of view of the person reading the information. So like this slide is saying that skepticism, like people can be way too skeptical to the point where it's like, like they don't believe anything that anybody says, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah. But I don't know. So it's, I guess this slide is just saying like, yeah, being skeptical is good, but you can probably take it too far too. Yeah. Uh, like not everything everyone's saying isn't true exactly yeah and then they added this slide um finding quality information when researching so like especially if you're doing like a report for a science class or a history class like where could you go to find some information that you could actually write an essay about and feel <laughs> um feel good about the information you're sharing like this is probably true so it would be yeah. like government or university website. So if it has .gov, .edu, or .org at the end of the website, um, school-supported research tools, there's like Britannica, or you can look for peer-reviewed articles or scholarly journals. Um, there's uh, use with caution. So you can still use these, and you probably do get a lot of information from these yellow ones. Ooh. Mm hmm Mainstream news sources, Wikipedia. Have you ever used that one? Yeah. Yeah. So the only thing to be cautious about is that the Wikipedia, any Wikipedia page, you can go in and edit it. Anybody can. It's like a public forum of uh -huh. information. So check the reference section of the page before you read it. Like, um, And then websites found mm -hmm. on Google just... Google will just bring up like the most popular search based on like what it thinks you're looking for. So yeah. make sure that you check the about us section and use critical thinking to determine if the website is reliable or not before using it. Like WebMD shows up on Google a lot. You could probably mm -hmm. trust that one. Yeah. Um, Unreliable source would be like Quora, Yahoo Answers, or any other Q&A website because none of those are fact-checked by anybody. Um, uh -huh. Social media posts co and comments are absolutely not yeah. fact-checked by anybody. So uh, politically motivated websites or satire or parody websites, basically like they're just jokes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. I think that's the end of the slideshow. I can, I'll probably just do, 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 cut the recording. <laughs>